Hello church, really good to be with you. Uh, we are doing things slightly differently today, as you can probably tell from the chairs behind me on the stage. Uh, we're going to be talking about small groups in a moment. In a moment, I'm going to have a, a conversation with a few people from our church family all about small groups and why they're so important. But first, why are we talking about this? Well, one of the things that I found when we first came to King's back in 2005 was something I'd never really experienced in a church before. It was this, that church life existed outside of Sunday mornings. I'd never experienced that before. Uh, we were put into a small group of people who met together each week and we read the Bible together, we prayed together, we did life together. And you know, this has always been a church of small groups. Ever since this church began, in fact, even before this church started meeting on Sunday mornings, groups of people met together in homes to read the Bible, to pray together, to do life together. And actually, you know, we were made for this. We were made to do life in community with other people. Our God is a relational God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he made us in his image. He's wired us for relationship with other people. And actually, it's in the richness of this community that we grow to become all that he has made us to be. I love what it says in Hebrews 10, verse 23. It says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, our growth as Christians requires being together. We can't do this on our own. We need to encourage each other to spur one another on. Now, of course, the events of the last couple of years have had a profound impact on our ability to do community with each other. So I remember when that first lockdown hit in March 2020, actually, I quite enjoyed the simplicity of life. If you're an introvert, then having some evenings in and having things taken out of the calendar, that can feel like quite a blessing. But I quickly realized how much I missed the presence of close friends. And in our small groups, we've seen real changes in the last couple of years in terms of the number of people connecting in. So again, two years ago in March 2020, we saw more people than ever before connecting into our online groups. Um, and it was all we had at that time, wasn't it? But then over the last couple of years, I think it's been more and more difficult for people to connect in for many reasons. I think life has just become tiring and complicated and we felt weary and drained. Many of us have formed new habits, but we need each other. We need community. Now, it's worth saying that small groups is an area of church life that we're wrestling with as leaders right now. We're praying into this. Our small group structure has changed over the years as we've grown as a church. And we've seen wonderful life and innovation in our small groups. But in this new season, we're asking again, what is God saying to us right now about groups? What is the best way to structure our groups to serve the church and to serve the amazing vision that God has given us for our town? But this morning, we just want to get back to really the heart of small groups and to talk about why they're so important. So I'm going to invite up three people. I'm going to invite up Ideji and Sylvia and Joy. Can you make them feel really, really welcome as they come up, please? Now, you'll notice there's another chair at the end here as well. We're going to hear from someone else, a great story from Small Groups right at the end as well. Um, but I want to start with you, Joy. Um, you told me, as we were talking about this morning, that you've been part of small groups in the church for 50 years. That's amazing, isn't it? 50 years of small groups. So all apart from one term, I think, in lockdown when you felt a bit zoomed out. So you step back from that term. But um, what have you experienced in small groups over the years and why are they so important to you? I found in small groups that uh, I can deepen my relationships with other people in my church family. And that's been very important to me. And um, it's a great place to be able to go and feel secure and to be able to share what's going on in your life. Um, <clears throat> a little while back, um, 
our daughter died very suddenly and very unexpectedly. And it was our small group that rallied around us and they supported us physically, emotionally, spiritually, practically. Uh, and then later on, we faced some more family problems. And again, the small group rallied around us. And I'm not so sure that we would have been here today if it hadn't been for their love and support. That's so, so good. So helpful, Joy. Um, it's, it seems to me like it's, this, is, this is family. Um, and I, w- I really want to pick up on this, this theme of family today, because this is something we feel like God is speaking to us about as a church. That, of course, the church is not an institution. It's not a business. It's a family. Um, but family means different things to different people. So I want to come to you on this, Sylvia. You lead one of our young adult groups. What does it mean for you, for your small group, to be family to you? Yeah, I really do see a small group as family. Um, and in Ephesians, Paul talks about the fact we're adopted into sonship with Christ. So we're all family here. But given the size of Kings, it's really great to be connected into a small group and be known and have that really close, uh, essentially, a yeah, family, brothers and sisters who you share and you do life with and you're accountable to each other. You check in on each other. If we've not seen someone in a couple of weeks, you know, Nicola and I will be asking where that person is because, you know, we really care for them. And when I joined Kings in 2016 and I was part of Christina Stewart's small group, it was a great way to get to know everyone. And I think without that, it would have been difficult to be known in the church. So, yeah, I hi- highly advocate being part of a small group. And it's just, it's great to have that family to do life alongside your brothers and sisters. And you've got friends who you might know from work or just other parts of life who if you don't if they don't share that same faith with you there's there's only so far the relationship can go and I think people in my small group who I've known a year or two I, I have like a very deep relationship with them because we're running the race together we're, we're all like living for the same purpose and it's, it's great to have that community thanks so I love this thing of kind of being known um being known in a church uh, Craig Rochelle is the leader of a huge church in the States, a life church. It's a church of about 30,000 people. But he said something that has, that has really stuck with me ever since I heard it. And it's this, that the reason people stay in a church is because they feel needed and they feel known. That we have a sense of purpose, that we need it, but also that we're known. That we have people that know what we're going through and know the events of our life and what's happening in our lives. And I think this doesn't just happen, does it? This, we have to be deliberate about this. It seems to me the world is becoming very, very isolated in all kinds of ways. We can have loads and loads of contacts, and yet we can still feel very, very lonely. So we have to be deliberate about connecting in uh, to community. So Ayadeji, you, you joined the church in July 2020. So I know that your only experience of small groups so far in this church is through online groups. But I know that you've been really, really deliberate about connecting into those groups and getting to know people. Why is this such a big deal to you? And how are you intentional about prioritizing small groups over other things? Thank you, Rich. Um, between June 2020 and, and now, we've moved houses twice and I've changed job twice. And all for very good reasons, I tell you. Um, life is busy, you know. Um, and I suppose it's not going to get less or busier, you know. Um, there will be things that will contain for our attention, for our time. And for us as a family, it's, it's more of surviving and flourishing, you know. Um, scripture talks about how the cares of this world have the potential of choking the life of God in a seed or in a believer. And we want to be very deliberate and prioritize things that help us to, you know, connect with God's people, to fellowship, to, to nurture the seed of God or, the, or, or our faith, really. Um, in Revelations, this talk, uh, Scripture talks about Babylon, a, a type of the system of the world. It says Babylon is, is, is drunk in the blood of the saint. And we know that the life of a thing is in its blood, which means that, you know, uh, distractions, things that contend and want to pull us away from God. And we don't drift into families or community. We have to be very, very intentional uh, about that. And that's, that's, that's the way we are. Um, also, 
there was an experience, you know, that was in the Bible where Jesus said to uh, the disciples that they should give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and they should give to God what belongs to God. I think our overriding purpose as a family is that under no circumstance would we ever give to Caesar what belongs to God. And so we just integrate. I opt from one group to another just to get grafted in and, you know, be part of what God is doing with, with his people. And Paul talks about how each joint supplies strength to the body. And that means as part of God's body, as you are, as I am, we have a responsibility. You know, God is calling us to, to supply strength to, to, the, to the body. And, and that's why. So I'm a man on a, on a mission to say. I love what you're saying as well about life. Life is not going to get less busy. There's never going to be a quieter time. And, you know, a term away from small groups can easily become a year and then two years. And so we need to be intentional about this. So, Joy, you, I know that it's like 50 years on from your, your first small group here. You're now leading a group of ladies who meet together week in, week out. Um, you pray together, you study the Bible together, you do life together. How much of this would you say is just about actually the, that decision to show up week after week at small groups? Yes, I am in a group with some fantastic ladies and uh, they all give it 100%. And uh, because of that, we get to know each other well. We're able to speak into each other's lives and... To, they are a real blessing to me to, to hear them pray, to uh, hear them share, and their love and commitment to Jesus is just wonderful. And I come away every week being blessed by them. That's brilliant, isn't it? It's so good to hear. Um, there's one kind of final area I want to kind of hone in on here. Uh, to do with small groups, and it's this area of diversity. So part of our vision is to be a diverse church of thousands. Uh, diverse in terms of ethnic backgrounds, but also diverse in terms of age, male and female, rich and poor, young and old. Um, so I want to come to you on this, Sylvia. I know that over the last six years, you've been in the, since you've been in the church, you've, you've kind of had people alongside you in small groups who are older than you, from different generations to you. What impact has this had on you? there, Christine and Stuart, and I was by far the youngest by probably a couple of decades. And I just, I just learned so much from people who have been walking with Christ a lot longer than I have. And I think about the verse in Ecclesiastes where there's nothing new under the sun and what has been will be. And I, I think that's a verse I mull on quite a lot because everything in life from like family struggles, relationship work, you know, you're not the only person to face it. And the Bible talks about troubles that will come. But if you're walking alongside people who have been following Christ for years and have experienced those tribulations, as Joy kind of spoke about, but you've, they've been able to get through the other side. Um, yeah, it's, it's really important to have that. And with our small group at the moment, we have Pete and Trish. Well, we had them in our small group. And yeah, their advice has just been like invaluable and they've offered such depth and breadth to the conversations that we have. And I, I think it's great to be in a group where you're not all the same, but um, yeah, you, are, you have a, a good mix from ages to race and everything. Something that's burning in me right now is this, that we would be a truly kind of intergenerational church where there's one generation feeding into the next, investing into the next and into the next, that we would see spiritual mothers and fathers in the church raising up spiritual sons and daughters because that, that's family, isn't it? That's family. So I'd love to see that all the more. So uh, I want to come to you finally on this, Ayadeji. This, this issue of diversity, I know this is really, really important to you. So I'm going to give you just a chance to cast a little bit of vision here. What, if we're to truly be family together as a church, what would you love to see across our small groups? Yeah, thanks, Rich. Scripture talks about how God set the solitary into families and family beyond blood. You know, uh, what, what, a, what an amazing thing that God will, uh, will, will s sacrifice so much. Someone said that when... God gave Jesus, he gave his best. And when he gave the Holy Spirit, he gave his all. And there's nothing left for God to do or to give. Um, I'm thinking about or reflecting about the fact that God will do so much to give his son, to give the Holy Spirit, just to save us, just to reconcile us. 
uh, Ephesians talk about whether we were far away from him, he has brought us close to be part of his family. And this family we're talking about is a mix of both black and white, purple and brown, you know, uh, those who are rich, those who are poor, those who are educated, those who are not, uh, those who are, you know, different st status in the society, really. And in Revelation, he's talked about how all those people, every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation will come together, would worship God. And it seemed to me that if God will, 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 will do all of that for us to, to, just because he wants a family for himself, then we have a responsibility also to make sure that the walls that God has broken down, we are not rebuilding that again in our fellowship, in our church life, in, in terms of forming cliques and, you know, different separate groups, you know. I, I remember when I first joined, um, it was very difficult to get into some small groups because right hours, why, after they've launched the small groups, it's already filled up. And I'm like, wow, how do I get in, you know. Uh, but the, the truth is that we are part of God's big family and we should be very open and generous in, in bringing people in, in accepting people, in, in, in integrating people, you know, to be part of that big family. And in Songs of Solomon, when he was talking about the church, he says, when I saw my bride, she was all together beautiful. And that's what I like to say. I love that, I did you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. In, this, in the context of this kind of talking about community then, we're going to hear a, a specific story from small groups. I'm going to ask you guys to stay on the stage for a minute. Can I invite Martin to come up? Let's make Martin feel really, really welcome as he comes up. Thank you so much, Martin. So, um, yeah, as I say, we're going to hear a specific story now which relates to one of our small groups. So, um, just to set the scene, Martin, so first of all, something happened to you 42 years ago that has had a deep, deep impact on you. Could you tell us what impact, what happened and what impact that had on you? Yeah, sure. I, um, I've written a couple of notes. Smile, enjoy and sit up. <laughs> so, um, another, another spoiler alert. I'll be reading this so I keep it uh, precise and on track. Also, I'm quite an emotional guy, and this has been quite an emotional ride for me, so um, bear with me. I've read it through to myself a couple of times, and I still get choked up sometimes, so uh, we'll see where we go. Anyway, to set the scene, I've been a Christian as long as I can remember, being raised by two lovely Christian parents. And in 1977, I joined the Metropolitan Police. In 1980, that's 42 years ago, as a very young PC, I was working out of Staines Police Station. And the incident Rich has asked me about happened on a warm spring Saturday afternoon. Just after lunch, I was called to a pub where there was a disturbance. Not an unusual call, being a weekend and people enjoying a drink or two, or perhaps more. I have found over the years that if people have too much to drink, they either fall over, fall asleep, or want to fight. I arrived at the pub, and the main person responsible for the disturbance was an Irishman. he had had too much to drink, and he hadn't fallen over, and he hadn't gone to sleep. No, he was the fighting kind. And despite my best reasoning, he decided that he wanted to take on the world. I ended up arresting him for being drunk and disorderly, and called for the police van, to take him back to Staines Police Station. The van arrived and with the help of another couple of officers, he was put in the van. He was still trying to fight and he was swearing, shouting, he was angry. I could see it in his eyes. And although he was in handcuffs, he was still kicking and struggling. So we had to physically restrain him. I was holding his legs so that he couldn't kick me or the other PCs. And during the struggle, he looked at me straight, straight in the eyes and said, I curse you with the crow's bones. 
Well, I didn't think too much of it at the time. I had other things on my mind. He was booked in at the police station, put in the cell to sleep it off, and I eventually booked off duty. Later on, however, I started to think about what the Irishman had said. Was I cursed? Did the words have any strength? If I was cursed, what should I do? How would I know? What would people think of me? I started to be quite concerned. But I knew in my heart as a Christian that I shouldn't be affected by what he said. And as time passed, I tried to forget what had happened that day. But from time to time, something would happen that brought the memories back to me. And even if the curse had no effect on me, the words he had spoken certainly had a hold on me. I didn't know what to do. Was I possessed? Would I need it to be exercised? There may be a humorous side to this, but for me it was very real. But instead of dealing with it, I sat on it. And I think we can all be guilty of sitting on things and holding on to things that we need to deal with. And I know that's easier said than done. I was worried that nobody would understand. What would people think of me? Was I creating something out of nothing? So every time I was reminded of these words, I would do my best to bury them and move on. I retired from the Metropolitan Police in 2007 and at King's Church in 2018, I arrived with this burden still on my back. Okay, thank you, Mark. So this is something that you carried with you ever since that moment. And then last autumn, you joined our training in supernatural ministry group. Uh, Could you tell us what happened in one of your recent sessions? As Rich said, uh, last year I joined the TSM group and we meet on a Thursday night at church. There's about 15 of us in the group and we've been following modules set, set by the church in Bedford. We've covered several topics relating to the Holy Spirit and during the sessions we have been encouraged to pray for each other for healing and other personal issues. These have been very, very precious times and the group has become very close. Because of that, we've been able to share in a way that has has, has not been threatening. The group is a very safe environment. We trust each other. Several months ago, we watched a video from Wendy Mann from Bedford on healing. Among other things, she talked about barriers which could hinder the working of the Holy Spirit And one of the things she mentioned that might inhibit healing was that of a curse. I was also reading a book at the time, which is unusual for me because I'm not a great reader, which also mentioned curses as being an obstacle to healing. This again brought up the issue that I've been carrying for all these years. It was almost as if God was prompting me to deal with it once and for all. So at one of the last meetings last term, I asked Sarah, who was leading the evening meeting, whether I could share something at the end of the session. She closed the meeting, turned to me, and I said, and said, I think Martin wants to share something. Well, yes, I did, but I wish I hadn't. And at that precise moment, I was tempted to say that it was nothing, bury it again and go home. In fact, the inner desire to bury the story again and not face up to it was immense. I took several deep breaths and started to tell the group what had happened all those years ago. I could hardly get the words out. I was fighting back the tears. But I knew that I was in a safe place and I was surrounded by my brothers and sisters in Christ and that I was surrounded by their love. I blurted out about what had happened and what the man had said to me all those years ago. As you can gather, I broke down in tears. But the group gathered round and they prayed for me. Not your average God bless Martin and may things be all right prayers. No, these were spirit filled, powerful prayers. As different members prayed, I sobbed, but as I did so, I felt a release of the fear and from the hold that those words had over me for all those years. As you would gather, it was all very emotional, 
And although I heard what was being prayed, I couldn't remember what was said. However, by the time the group had finished praying, I felt a real sense of inner peace. And Charlie, who's one of the group, had spoken into the situation amongst the prayers. So afterwards, I contacted her by WhatsApp to ask her to let me know what she said. And this was her answer. <clears throat> Hi, Martin. When you were sharing, I physically felt a sense of fear. And God said to me that when that man tried to curse you, the curse did not stick to you, but it caused you to fear. And that was the only thing that you needed to be set free from. That stronghold of fear that he caused. When Alem prayed deliverance over you, I felt a huge sense of peace. And God said that he removed the spirit of fear and replaced it with peace. I also felt that if the enemy tries to make you fear again, just reminded that it, was been, it all has been dealt with. You are covered by the blood of Jesus and no curse can stick to you. I really appreciate you sharing that so openly and so honestly. And what I love about that is there's power in, in community. Jesus set you free, but he did it in the context of community amongst the prayers of the saints. And I just love the, the, the community of that and, and, what, and what God's done in that. Can we thank uh, these guys? I'm gonna, I, in a moment, so I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm going to explain how small groups will work this term. But let's just thank Martin and Sylvia and Ayadeji and Joy so much for everything they've brought this morning. Let's thank them. It's encouraging, isn't it? God is at work here. He's at work in our small groups. And we, there's loads of things we haven't talked about to do with small groups. We haven't talked about mission, about reaching out. And some of our groups over the last few years have been set up deliberately to do this. And we don't want to lose that sense of purpose. But I hope those conversations have helped focus again on the importance of community and on being connected and the power in that and how intentional we need to be. So the question is this, how about you? Are you part of a small group? Have you been part of a small group recently? I'm just going to explain how we're doing small groups this term. I said earlier we're praying right now into the future of our small groups. But one thing we believe God is saying to us right now is this, that we're to pursue intimacy with Jesus. We're to go after intimacy with Jesus. So we're starting a new teaching series in two weeks called Sit at His Feet. And this is a chance just to focus our attention on Jesus, to slow down and to put him at the center. And so this term, we are focusing all our small groups around this series. So each Sunday, we'll teach on a different aspect of Jesus' character, things like his gentleness, his power, his joy. Uh, and then within our groups, we'll reflect back on the Sunday teaching and we'll make space to encounter Jesus together in those groups. Now, we would love as many people as possible to experience this, so we've made it really, really simple for you to join a group this term. If you're already part of a group, then hopefully conversations have already happened about whether the group's continuing this, uh, this term, whether it's following that series. But if you're not part of a group, and this is for people in the room and you watching at home as well, you can, do, you can join one very simply just by going to our website, following the link to the small groups page, and there you can let us know the day of the week that works best for you. And we will, we will connect you with a group. We'll allocate you to a small group. If you're not sure whether you're part of a group, just sign up anyway. And we'll make sure you're connected in. The groups will begin in the week starting the Monday, the 9th of May. Church, we were made for community with each other. God is calling us to be family. And he's drawing us into intimacy with Jesus all the more. And the best place for this to happen is in community with others in small groups. If you're not in a group, can I encourage you, please, please, please sign up for a small group this term. Okay, I'm going to hand over now to John and Nicola. Thanks. Thanks.